Hello students, in this video we'll prove Hurwitz's theorem and understand how that relates to sequences of holomorphic functions which are injective. So Hurwitz's theorem states the following. It says, let Fn map omega into C be holomorphic. Converging uniformly on compact subsets. Compact subsets of omega to f, which is also going to be holomorphic, right? That's Marrero's theorem by Marrero. Then, if C is a simple regular curve, so it's closed. And um, that means the index is either one or zero. And we look at the interior of C, and for points on the interior of C, we have the index, the index of C and A is equal to one. Okay. Then for sufficiently large n, the number of zeros of F n in the interior, the zeros of F n in the interior of C have to be the zeros of f, right, for n bigger than or equal to n and the interior inside c. Okay. In the proof of this, it took longer to state the proof of Hurwitz's theorem than to prove it, because to prove it, we should use Rochet's theorem, right? So let's, um, so since c is a compact subset, we can find, and I'm assuming that, of course, f does not vanish on c, right? So let c be a curve, be such a curve, proof be such a curve on which f has no zeros, then neither will, G, neither will fn for n sufficiently large, right? Then pick delta greater than zero such that Delta is the minimum over this circle of f of z. And I can do this by the minimum principle, right? By the minimum principle for holomorphic functions. Okay, use the minimum principle. Then choose n capital and n such that, such that what? Such that f n of z minus f of z is less than delta if n is bigger than or equal to n capital, right? Well, if that's the case, then this implies, this implies f n of z minus f of z is less than what? Is less than delta, right? And delta is the minimum, right? So this is less than or equal to the modulus of f of z on c. And so that says that f, n, and f have the same number of zeros inside C, hence by Roche. f, n, and f have the same number of zeros inside, inside C. Okay, good. All right, and so, of course, you can reframe this, of course, in terms of when the function f is zero, right? So in other words, if I give you a sequence of holomorphic functions, fn, so I can rephrase this as a corollary of this would be the following. So a corollary would be that if fn are holomorphic functions which don't vanish,
on omega. So I give you some non-vanishing holomorphic functions, and Fn converges uniformly. To F, then either F is identically equal to zero, okay, or um, F is zero free also, is zero free. Okay, excellent. Of course, what's the way that we, this? How can I have a situation where fn are not zero, but f, can, f is itself is zero? If I look at this example, there's the, the classic example to think of, right? I can take fn of z just to be one over n. Those are never equal to zero, and then fn uniformly, so but one over n uniformly converges on complex subsets to zero, right? And of course, that's identically equal to zero. So that's the that's the counterexample over here, right? And so the conclusion from this is that you can also use this to re rephrase injectivity, right? So in other words, if also if fn are injective, right, right, and converge uniformly, that says that either f is what? Identically equal to zero, or f is constant, or f is, in, f is injective, f1 to 1, right? So in other words, that's, that's the dichotomy. So in other words, if you don't like zero, you can put it with any constant you want, right? It's to say all these things are the exact same line of reasoning, right? So in other words, we have if we have a uniform sequence of holomorphic functions which converge uniformly on complex subsets to a function f, if all those functions are injective, then either the holomorphic function that converges to is a constant, or the holomorphic function itself has to be one to one. Very, very powerful tool because constants are easy to handle, right? So the other kids are either you're a constant or you're in a situation that's very good, right? So in other words, if these functions, and we're going to show in further videos that if you have like a, if you have an inverse function, that the inverse function shares lots of the same stru structure of the things that are converging to the inverse function. So we get lots of useful information about the structure of inversions of holomorphic functions and biholomorphic functions from this Hurwitz theorem. Thank you very much.